Glad to have you back. I am Ngozi Alebu. While you're still watching Arise News coverage of the off-cycle governorship election in Imo, Kogi and Bayelsa states, of course, we dwelled a lot, quite a lot on the situation in Kogi there. Well, former President uh, Goodluck Jonathan has asked the National Assembly to work towards stopping off-season elections. Well, the Nigerian leader said this after casting his ballot at polling Unit 39, Ward 13, Otoke, Obia, local government area of Bayelsa State. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first, let me congratulate uh, the three states that have elections today, Bayelsa State, uh, Imo State, and Nikogi State, and which all these state successful elections, peaceful conduct of elections. But basically, because this is an off-season election, and uh, I, I get worried about the issue of off-season elections, and I will use this unique opportunity to plead with the National Assembly that we need to block these off-season elections. It's a very odd, it's not a global best practice. A country can have, uh, can elect their people at different times, like America, some countries, not everybody at the same time. But any time they go on to the election, they elect everybody that's supposed to be elected. If we continue with this trend of off-season elections based on the interpretation of our laws by the judicial officer, it will come to a time that the presidential election in Nigeria may be off-season. Probably that is the time that all of you media people and others should be worried. Every look at the American system, everybody knows when the American elections will be conducted. That's standard, standard practice in other countries. And when I say presidential election in Nigeria may be off-season one day, some people may get to say, why, how? It almost happened in 2007 that I, con I contested as a running mate to late President Yaradua. You know that election, the seven justices that presided over the case, three of them, in their own judgment that election be annulled, four of them sustained the election. And that is why we stayed. If one has crossed over, by now, the presidential election in Nigeria would have been off-season election. And it is not the best for a country. And there are easy things to do to make sure that other states, now we have seven states that are off-season. We need to stop there. And where possible, these seven states too can be migrated back to fall in line with the other states. And the National Assembly can do that. That is uh, the, my message for the National Assembly, my message for Nigerians today. On the other hand, I wish the election successful. I've been monitoring what is happening in Bayelsa State. I almost uh, ask people across the local governments. And for now, no major uh, things that we will get worried, apart from uh, the part of Nimbe local government, the Basambri part of Nimbe local government that have been in conflict for quite some time before the election. Uh, apart from that, I think uh, the elections are going on well, but we cannot conclude until at the end of the voting period. So once again, I thank you and I wish you well. Uh, former President Goodluck Jonathan there, while well, still staying in Bayelsa State, despite a few cases of uh, security concerns in some areas, uh, voting in Kolokuma Opokuma uh, Council area was largely peaceful. In the Opokuma part of the local government area, uh, where voter turnout was a bit impressive, a former managing director of the Niger Delta Development Commission, Timi Alaibe, cast his ballot. While in a nearby unit, a House of Assembly representative, Wisdom Fafi, also performed his civic duty. Has been uh, punctual in this community. They came in early. Uh, election started very at appropriate time, the correct time. So we we feel that this exercise is going on smoothly and we believe that um, the results as desired will come through without any problems. The technology deployed is working, as you can see, is, um, is efficient and we hope that the technology will back the results that will emanate from the process. I don't support the idea of manual um, collation of results. We hope that sometime in our country, legislation will come up to back elect uh, electronic transmission of results. Kolokmo Pokma has been a peaceful local government from the onset. We have not recorded any form of violence in previous elections, and this one will not be this, uh, different. Uh, 
you can see people are queued in the line very orderly no noise very civil and i want to believe that uh, at the end of the day uh, it will end peacefully i must commend INEC. Uh, materials came on time and uh, voting commenced almost immediately uh, they didn't waste time at all like look at my thumb i've also voted and it was seamless uh, so far so good i want to commend them and i just hope and pray that uh, uh, we shouldn't have any negative experience. Well, low turnout of voters marred the governorship election in Imo State. Uh, the poll opened as early as 8.30 a.m. with accreditation and voting going on uh, simultaneously in various polling units. Uh, but the turnout of voters not very impressive. In Otolu Primary School in Oru West local government area of uh, Imo State, booth 002 and 003, INEC officials uh, were available alongside electoral materials, but the voter turnout not encouraging. The same scenario played out at Omuma booth uh, 032, where election officials and materials were on ground, but few people were available to express their franchise well i just observed that the voters uh, on the queue uh, appear to be very enthusiastic and you could see the kind of joy that uh, they're expressing and uh, the conduct has been very oddly you can see the queue is very straight and there is no interference they have not seen anything that is uh, suggesting that there will be any likelihood of uh, uh, disorganization. So I mean, it's an impressive outing too. You can see the number of people uh, that have come out to vote. Well, Governor Hope was Odima there. Uh, at the time he made that observation, it was about 11.30 or thereabout. He, that's when he went out to vote. Uh, so uh, it may not necessarily be a reflection of what the overall impression about the voter turnout in Imo State uh, is. Well, joining me now in the studio is Arms Free Ajanoku, fact-checking team lead at the Center for Democracy and development and I still have with me in the studio the current affairs analyst and professor of communications at Bayes University. He's also deputy dean uh, faculty postgraduate school. Uh, thank you both of you gentlemen. Thank you especially uh, you just joining us uh, on this special coverage. Um, where would you like to start from? I mean, we heard uh, former president there say, look, there's a need for us to block off-season elections. And uh, so far, INEC seems to be getting a you know, lot of patting on the back uh, for its performance uh, so far. Will it remain so? You know, eventually, when the results begin to uh, come out, we will uh, see. And then there's the issue of voter apathy, especially in places like uh, Imo State there. Unpack all of that. Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, starting with the comments of the former president, uh, I think the concerns are justifiable, but the question is, which do you put first? Uh, do mm. you put the attitudinal change you require in our political process first, or do you put um, an artificial process of legislating away the reality of off circle elections? Uh, so I think that's a fundamental question we need to ask, because... Uh, we, should, we should ask ourselves, how did we get here in the first place? How did we get to the point of having uh, some elections off cycle and some uh, you know, within the uh, normal election season? Uh, the reason was electoral impunity. The reason was that you know, political actors did not play according to the rules. Mm -hmm. And because uh, they did not do that, um, you know, the, the elections had to go to the judiciary to adjudicate. And we are still dealing with that problem till today. Uh, is it just that, sorry I have to butt in here, yeah. or you know, all the litigation, is it an indictment on INEX, uh, what some would say lack of transparency, you know, lack of thoroughness in the conduct of the election in a way that makes it possible uh, for people to disagree you know, and go to court? No, no, I, I would put it down to the role of the political actors. I okay. do not think um, INEC, INEC, uh, yes, it has its own challenges. Mm. In fact, it has its own uh, internal contradictions. But um, you would look back at all of the cases. Uh, is it the governorship, um, you know, cases, whether you talk about Oshun, you talk about Edo, 
Uh, those were cases in which the political actors exhibited desperation in trying to rig elections, in trying to subvert the process. And um, you know, the opponents who lost those elections did not feel they lost it fair and square. And they had to approach the judiciary to seek redress. And the, you know, the judiciary in those cases did the right thing in uh, ensuring that um, you know, the, uh, the rightful winners actually emerged you know, mm. from, from those processes. So uh, it will be too simplistic to narrow it down to um, you know, INEC alone. Okay. Uh, because we still continue to see, and uh, by the way, uh, earlier on, we just issued our preliminary statement you know, from uh, the CDD. Uh, where you know we de deployed um, like 150 observers across the three states, okay. including um, fact checkers and information um, disorder specialists who were uh, looking at the space. What and do you have so far? Yeah, what one of the things uh, we we flagged again was uh, you know uh, although it comes in pockets now the role that, that violence has has played in these elections we saw in uh, in Kogi and all of this. so if those attitudes put together do not change from you know the way. Uh, the political actors approach the, the process, then you might legislate all the elections into one season, but at the end of the day, they will still do the same things that will make those elections go off season. Uh, so I think that's a, a fundamental point uh, we, we need to make. Mm. Uh, the other point uh, on the positive side for INEC in this election is uh, uh, what we already flagged as the synergy uh, a very robust synergy that we saw between INEC and the security agencies. Right. And so the fact that we didn't see uh, as much uh, violence like we saw, uh, you know, in previous uh, situations where uh, outlaws would just overrun the electoral process is, I mean, kudos to that synergy that has happened. Uh, the election security process has been uh, a bit well, uh, you know, managed this time, even though we still had, uh, you know, pockets of, of issues here and there. Then mm. on the positive side, too, because uh, we must also uh, uh, try and, um, you know, uh, infuse some dose of optimism in the process because right. Nigeria is actually experiencing democratic decline. So we do not want to send out that message that the democratic process is failing completely. So where we see uh, something to cheer about, mm -hmm. uh, we should uh, also spotlight it as a way of encouraging citizens that they can uh, believe in the process and if they participate in the process, there are room, it is, there's room for improvement. Uh, like um, if you look at the functionality of the beavers in this uh, particular right. election, we saw uh, marked uh, improvement in terms of response time when, they, when there were challenges. Our observers you know, reported all of that, mm -hmm. that uh, where uh, there were problems with the beavers, um, there was you know, immediate troubleshooting and you know, uh, the issue was uh, resolved uh, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the downside, of course, still remains the, uh, the perennial issue of logistics, INEC logistics. Uh, our observation showed um, you know, late arrival uh, Sixty-five percent of our polling units, where we observed, you know, showed late arrival in a place like Imo. Uh, Eighty percent in in a place like Kogi. I uh, know in a place like Bayosa, and then uh, forty-five percent in a place uh, uh, in a place like Kogi, uh, where which uh, had uh, a more uh, you know bet better opening time, you yeah. know, after um, you know around the time uh, stipulated for opening. So I will now come to the issue of um, apathy, which you also raised, uh, mm. and try to unpack it from the point of view of you know, what we saw in the build-up to the election, uh, which is the fact that uh, disinformation has played a very big role in this election. Right. And disinformation means that, uh, you know, certain actors are feeding certain kinds of information in the space to make voters react in certain ways and also to delegitimize the institutions. INEC, for example, the security mm -hmm. agencies. So uh, that's the role of um, the fact-checking in all of this process. Right. Uh, uh, CDD uh, actually did a lot of fact-checking. Uh, we have our soldiers of mouth uh, deployed right. across the three of cycle states, uh, 25 per state, that are actually uh, looking at what are the narratives. Uh, for example, yesterday um, we saw a narrative going around that one of the candidates in Imo had stepped down mm -hmm. when he had not. So we had to do that. Uh, whole work of fact-checking and then uh, getting to the candidate and he said, no, I'm still very much in the race. Uh, and we also I wonder with all this fact-checking, does it yes. really, um, you know, trickle down to the uh, electorate, to the voter at the end of the day or the damage is done, you know, uh, how much, you, you just wonder how much damage is done at the end of the day with this, you know, fake uh, news or disinformation as you refer to it. Uh, very quickly, let me, let me bring you uh, in again to this conversation. Um, uh, Ajanoku here has raised some uh, points. 
attitudinal change. Mm -hmm. They do say that a thing actually possesses the character of its handler. You know, like I say, I mean, if, if a person is mm -hmm. um, untidy or they're dirty, if you look at their car, it may just reflect, you know, that attitude. Mm -hmm. So how do we begin to change this attitude that doesn't seem to align with exactly what our goal, our objective is at the end of the day, you know, to engender a better society, good governance and what have you, and use the ballot to achieve that. People are running away. People are saying, look, I couldn't be bothered because at the end of the day, look, the, the results are already fixed. Yeah, it's a, very, it's a very tough one if it's a fundamental one and it can actually be very, very problematic, you mm -hmm. know, because even in, at the level of um, understanding um, the world over, it is very clear that when it comes to changing people's behavior, you know, um, it's one of the toughest kind of challenge you can embark on. And because behaviors grow over time, you know, after uh, and become patterns, become a peculiarity, become a particularity. And um, if you want to change it, sometimes it looks like you're trying to shift um, it's, it's like um, strolling between the hard place and the rock, you know. But it's not to say that attempts cannot be made. They cannot be made. I think that the attitude of the average um, citizen, you know, towards election, um, is not just something we should look at from the peripheral level. It's something that is deep-seated and scones within um, our political economy, you know, where, um, you know, moneyism has been privileged yeah. as the, great, the biggest value. And, of course, one of the quickest Vote ways... trading. Uh, yeah. One of the quickest way in which you can uh, become rich in this country, even stupendously so, is just by being in government. And of course, we can see um, succession of traits, you know, um, one after the other, irrespective of pronouncement, irrespective of uh, preachments to the contrary, or, you know, or um, what people say, you know, of course, there's a distance Yeah, but it's one thing to say, say it's one saying. thing to preach, That's it. That, do yeah, the right yeah, thing, but, but it's another yeah. thing, you know, to actually get people to do it. Yeah, yeah, but if you look at... How you do you make people do what you say? Well, there are two things, really, that can happen, in right. my own opinion. And if you look at history and the sociology of countries, the political evolution of countries, it can happen in two ways. You know, it having a strong leader, right, right? you know, whose uh, ways, whose patterns, uh, will rub off on the patterns of the populace, you know, because they know that it's got a broader picture of mm -hmm. um, the citizenry in mind, you know, um, is concerned about generations of people, how they can um, improve their standard of living, grow the country at the level of value, respectability, reputation, etc., etc. A kind of hero, you know, but I doubt if we, yeah. have, if we have gone close to that, you know, uh, yet. You know. But the, sec the second one, of course, is also institutional strengthening. And institutional threatening cannot, does not happen in a vacuum. It's, right. not, it's not an inanimate uh, process. Mm -hmm. It will happen through individuals as well. You know, individuals who, who are choose credible. choose to do the right yeah, thing. Yeah, who wants to do the right thing. Right. And it will rub off on, on, the on the institutions because there's a dialectical interconnection between the two, you know. Uh, but how do we come about this again? We've been having changes in government. And I don't know what your own opinion is, but it, sometimes it seems that um, we're not making progress, just like he alluded to. The previous uh, government is always better than the... Yeah, you begin yeah. to wonder. Yeah. Sometimes you think the that the, the, past, the past it's is... called retrogression. Yeah, you know, that it, sometimes you think that the past is better than the present. Right. And it has become like um, our being, really. But uh, what, what we can do again is to maybe uh, continue what we're doing, you know, irrespective of the absence of good impression that we are having. Uh, at least let's take the positives out of what we have. And mm -hmm. from those positive, of course, we can probably build on it, strengthen the process continually, raise questions, create, um, establish the disparity between credibility and the absence of it, between integrity and the absence of it, especially in the electionary process. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact checking, the fact checking that they do is just simply telling, uh, trying to tell us that, look, um, this process, irrespective of what the institutions are saying, what INEC is saying, what the political parties are saying, is still riddled with um, things that we can describe as um, lack of integrity, and it shouldn't be so. So by the time we see the gap between the good and between good and bad, between the correct and incorrect, they will probably know the distance. We see, we probably still can imagine the distance that we still have to cover, mm. as the case could be. But it's a continuous effort. The thing is that we should not. Uh, give up because yeah, but the thing is, are we making progress backwards or are we making progress? No, we are making know, progress. Uh, I'm afraid. I, I we are making progress, who... even though we think, even though we can imagine that we probably will have done better, mm -hmm. but we are not doing badly. In my own opinion, you know, um, there's a difference between somebody who has an A in an exam mm -hmm. and somebody sometimes who has a D 
in an exam as well. If somebody has a D, it's still a pass in some cases, and the person that has an A is right. also a pass, you know. And um, what the person that has a, a D has to do is to improve. Keep working hard so that you can probably do better next time and then maybe conclude with an A. I don't know, the fundamentals of democracy is about the people going to the polls, choosing who they want freely, without any, you know, fear or let or even hindrance. But we find ourselves in our democracy so far, where the judiciary is right smack in the middle of it. Would you say, with all you're saying so far, that we're making progress? Yes, so... As uh, far as our democracy is concerned? Yes, so I think that's a very uh, insightful question, even though it's also complex on its own. Uh, but we'll try to un unpack it, uh, maybe uh, for me... Uh, and I, I ask that based on your findings so yeah. far. I mean, you are the one, you, you've been carrying yes. out your research yes. over time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, I think I want to take inspiration in the words of Bartok Brett, you know, the German playwright who yeah. said, contradictions are only hope. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the fact that we have a system involving and inherent in that system are challenges, inherent in that system, system you know, are contradictions. We should take that as you know hope that we can fix or address you know uh, you know some of those contradictions that I imagine. Uh, we cannot wish you know wish away the fact that we we have made progress in a lot of respects. Uh, Which aspects would you really yeah, say yeah, that we've made uh, progress? Yeah. So <laughs> for for instance, the the fact that we have even managed the idea of civil rule democracy up to this point uh, is a milestone that we cannot, uh, we, can, we cannot wish away. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have always argued in uh, the Center for Democracy and Development that it is not enough to talk about uh, just democracy as an abstraction. Democracy has to deliver for the people. And like you rightly said, it has to be such a process that people can have their freedom, the freedom to vote without you know, people over, you know, uh, uh, coming in and overrunning an electoral space, for example, mm -hmm. is one of the things that should come with democracy. If we are not getting it uh, right in that regard, what should we do? Uh, for example, after the 2023 general elections, CDD made one recommendation, mm. which is a comprehensive audit of the electoral process, an audit that would show us what worked and what did not work. Right. If you have that in place, then you see how to address some of the mistakes. Uh, because whether we like it or not, the gaps and the issues from the 2023 process are still, in a way, uh, you know, playing out in, in this process. So mm. if you talk about voter apathy, for example, mm. many of the people uh, who, who talked you know, to us on the field would always refer back to 2023. Right. They'll say uh, uh, that election, uh, we put all our energy into it, and some of uh, a large chunk of the voters were just coming out for the f very first time to vote, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know they felt that the process did not uh, really reflect you know you know you know the the effort they had put into it, and so they they, they have become discouraged and despondent, and and they've not really uh, you know they not really no, they, uh, they, they no longer believe that you know the process you know really. And how would, dangerous would work is that, especially when you consider the fact? I'm sure based on your figures, a lot of young people actually uh, came out. Uh, to register for the first time, you know, pick up their PVCs and vote for the first time. And as far as they're concerned, they've been largely uh, disappointed. How do we regain that, you know, uh, confidence? confidence? But let's, uh, let me put you on hold. Uh, cross live to Ida in Kogi State, where Arise uh, correspondent Omo Bazwaye is uh, live for us. Omo, you have a smile on your face. That says a lot. Uh, you have some good news uh, to deliver uh, to us. Uh, good to see you. So, uh, I mean, what can you tell us so far? What's uh, the latest? Well, the, the latest, of course, is that um, election, uh, governorship election in Kogi East, where I have been in the last two days, has finally come. And um, it's been a very, very busy day for all. Um, the people themselves, the security operatives, INEC officials, all of them trying to ensure that uh, this particular election, unlike several other elections that we have heard about in uh, Kogi State, uh, turn out, turns out differently. And I think to an extent, 
some of those fears that we were nursing um, weeks ahead of these particular elections, we have not actually you know, seen them. I'm not saying that there haven't been you know, elements of hitches here and there, uh, but these hitches, especially as regards to equipment that were deployed for this particular election by the Independent National Electoral Commission, uh, we haven't been seeing those hitches and glitches that characterized um, part of the elections uh, in February, some, something that uh, our guest in the studio uh, was referring to earlier on. Um, and also in terms of um, violence, you, you know that Kogi, uh, especially where I am right now, the, in the east of it, which borders part of Edo, Anambra and Enogo, you know, it has this reputation of being a very wild and violent during election period. Um, I have heard about uh, a few skirmishes, but they were quickly put on hold by the help of uh, security operatives. We are coming in into um, Ida and driving in from Lokoja, the capital. You will find a battalion of security operatives, especially the military, which I think their presence had made quite a number of difference uh, uh, for this particular you know, outing that we are presently seeing. Um, but in all in all, I, I think um, for the people of Kogi East, particularly here in Ida E5, kind of leave the the, the the lens of my camera a little. Maybe you could see behind behind me. You will see some children, you know, excited, already feeling that the saint of victory is not far off from their own choice candidate. And that's talking about the candidate of the Social Democratic Party, SDP, Moitala Ajaka, you know, and the feeling is the same all around here, you know, um, from Ida to Igumale to other parts, Basa, and other places that you can talk about in um, Kogi East where um, this particular candidate, you know, has seemed to have a very strong, you know, stronghold. So in all, um, whatever it is that has been, um, if you like, the, the good side of this particular election, I think the, the greatest um, heroes of this particular election has been the people of Kogi State, who since very early this morning, many of them have turned out from 6 a.m. And they, they stood there and waited until um, INEC officials came to start erecting polling units that took their time to go through um, their names on the wall and then finally get on the queue to get accredited and then had finally taken the vote. But they didn't stop at that. They stayed back and ensured that they watched how the votes were sorted and counted. So that so much can summarize what we have experienced here. Um, yes, there have been one or two skirmishes. I happen to, to, to um, uh, come across a particular incident that again, that was quickly, you know, uh, mellowed down by the security operatives. Uh, member of the House of Representatives was trying to, allegedly do, trying to um, um, do some vote buying, but I understand that uh, the people themselves were the ones who, uh, who quelled that particular, you know, incident in Gazi. Omar Bazwa, you very well put there. I mean, uh, the people are the hero, and that sounds like music to the ears, really. Uh, I, I'm glad you looked behind you, because I was actually going to draw your attention to that, uh, wondering what the youth were doing. Are they pulling, uh, you know, pulling off... Uh, you know, uh, bills, handbills, or what have you. But it's a good thing it looks like a celebratory uh, mood there. But let's talk about uh, the process and where it's going next. I mean, collation and what have you until, of course, uh, the results are finally uh, known. Uh, walk us through the process of what to expect going forward from here. Uh, well, right about this time, um, in some polling units. Um, I understand that um, sorting is still being going on and counting as well. Uh, and then right from that polling unit, then I think the material, the results will move down to the world level. Look at government level from where they are collated properly before they are down sent down for the final collation and announcement at the headquarters of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, in Lokoja. And that is where we arise. We'll be moving um, um, towards, you know, um, once all of these process at the local level, within the senatorial level as well, are finally concluded. 
Before I let you go, yes, there's been a lot of talk about voter apathy, uh, you know, possible vote buying and all of that. But in the cause of all of this, have you heard from the people in terms of the issues that were, you know, uh, talked about in the course of, uh, you know, campaigning and all of that? Are you able to clearly say, look, uh, for the uh, typical uh, Kogi electorate, this is what they had in mind as they went to the polls? Well, I, I, I can't be able to talk um, completely in one whole for the entire people of Kogi State. But in the last two or three days, um, I have been in majorly centered around Kogi East. And Kogi East has nine local governments out of the 21 local government areas of uh, uh, the state. And that makes this particular place one of the uh, major areas of power concentration when you talk about the contestation for power in this particular state the numbers are here in fact some people say that this is where elections are won and lost in in this state so um campaigns in in here all the all the various candidates and by the way 18 candidates are in this particular race it's just that um some, about three of them, have emerged as the leading candidate, and that's, that is where majorly um, the media have concentrated almost all of his you know, attention to. And so, um, if you look at how these um, three, look, three central districts have been shared, it seems as though um, it has been shared uh, across the three major candidates, which is talking about the Kogi Central, where Usman Ododo of the APC is from, and... Um, uh, Kogi West, where f uh, former federal lawmaker Dinomilai uh, is supposed to be his own um, stronghold as well. And then right here in um, Kogi East, where there is Muritala Ajaka of the Social Democratic Party. So, um, here, right here in Kogi East, um, even though one would not want to easily want to admit it, but what is actually uh, the feeling here is that it's about time power returns to this particular place. And that is why most of the people here, you know, seem to have voted along one particular direction. And speaking about campaign messages, every one of them, every one of the major candidates appear to have sold to the electorate the same kind of manifesto, the same kind of election campaign promises. It has resolved around the issues of their welfare, for example, it has resolved around, you know, maybe the need for, you know, better infrastructure. And indeed, the state, um, founded 1991, really needs, is in their need of so much of this social infrastructure. My trip from Lokoja to where I'm currently standing here in uh, uh, Ida, you know, uh, you could see all around. I mean, uh, it's it's kind of obvious. So, so, so when you hear the index, Human Capital Index, you know, stating that the state, out of 36 states in the country, is rated as 20, 23, then one would then understand. But the people, um, maybe it's not really the campaign promises that after, um, to an extent, there is always this feeling that. Um, Power should move around and shouldn't be static in one point. And so almost every one of them, you know, wants at some point that the power should return to them. And that has been the major sentiment around this particular election. And also we spoke about um, vote buying. Yes, we have um, seen, we have heard a few instances and uh, uh, it appears as if the people still collected the money and did what is in their mind. So yeah, that's a very good place uh, to live it. Thank you so much. Omar Bazwai joining us uh, live from Ida in Kogi State uh, there, a senior correspondent. Uh, well, we still have uh, the gentleman here, Professor Abiodun Adini is still very much in the studio here. And of course, Amsri Ajanoku. Um, uh, Prof, you heard what uh, Omar had to say <laughs> there. At the tail end of his intervention, yeah. he said, look, it really wasn't much about mm -hmm. issues in terms of, you know, deliverables of yeah. governance. Mm -hmm. It was more of a, it's our turn. Mm -hmm. it, we haven't had it here. 
And so it's, it's a time for us to, you know, uh, have a taste of what governance feels yeah, like. So, is so, that so practically what we're doing saddening is just, for you? Yeah, of course, <laughs> definitely saddening. But what we're seeing is actually political activity. You know, we're having political activities now and again without a soul. Right. You know, there's no soul, there's no conscience to it, there's no value or virtue to it. Um, there's no character to it, you know. Um, every time we have an election, yes, it's successful. Security agencies are deployed, monies are released. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have an activity. It's okay. Yeah, we we'll keep going on like that. Somebody is elected, fine. He keeps, um, he, he stays there for four years, uh, maybe gets a second term, you know, gets a successor. We we'll keep going like that, you know. But the, in terms of character, in terms of the content of our democracy is still yeah. the problem. And that's what he's saying there. Yes, and we we'll alluded to it earlier on mm. about what we can do in the circumstance. What uh, more can we do other than what, than what we have said, you know? Uh, perhaps, you know, the line we can do is a line of um, continual sensitization, the creation of awareness. But that cannot be done in a vacuum as well. Who do you want to preach to? Somebody who is very, very, very difficult to preach to somebody who is very hungry, you know, not to collect Yeah, 10, but then again, it depends on who will be doing the preaching. Is it the politicians who want to preach, you know, you out of ignorance? Uh, a lot has been said about the weaponization of poverty and weaponization of ignorance, if you mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's to the advantage of the political gladiators themselves who but want to ensure that the people uh, continue to remain ignorant and play up those, mm. you know, uh, base but, but let me make, sentiments. But let me make one last point, right? Yes. I, I'm not um, uh, too, I'm not pessimistic, really. Right. I still believe that there are windows for us to make improvement, and that's if we keep at it. I remember one um, politician, or is he an election administrator, said um, that the solution to a problematic democracy or a declining democracy mm. is more democracy. You know, perhaps uh, through happenstance, <coughs> you know, we'll get somebody who is conscientious enough to drive the process of change so that we can begin to alter the narrative towards a salutary one that we want. And of course, um, democracy is hardly perfect. And that's why we have yardsticks for measuring it across the world. America is popular as a democracy, but it's not still the best. You know, the best democracies are in the Scandinavian countries, which means means that there are rooms for improvement in every democracy. And in our own case, we are just 24 years at it. It's not to say that we should continue to paper the crack or stomach the, the, the problematics that we're recognizing, that we're identifying, but just to say that, yes, there is hope, there is some silver lining if we keep at it, if we work at it, if we are deliberate and intentional about the measures we take at improving uh, right. the process. But without those measures will have to be driven by a conscientious leader, you know, who wants to leave his name in gold, you know, right. who wants to leave a legacy, you know, of uh, triggering um, a narrative that we consider uh, unhelpful. So we can only hope that the present leaders have that mindset of wanting to write their name in gold and Hopefully, not yeah. just mm -hmm. governing for, just to be named as having been mm -hmm. in government. Ajanoku, mm -hmm. uh, you heard Omo Bazwaye there say that the people are the hero in this uh, uh, process. Uh, does it give you that silver lining that Prof talks about? Does it give you hope that, okay, indeed, it's beginning to be about the people? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, the, these reflections are really very important because uh, we are able to contextualize, uh, you know, the roles of the different actors and uh, the people of Kogi State uh, uh, as well as all the other states mm -hmm. um, have, you know, uh, really, uh, you know, d for those who came out to participate in the process, they uh, have really demonstrated uh, a commitment uh, that you would say, uh, given the circumstance, uh, it's, it's, it takes guts, you know, given uh, the experiences, given, you know, how uh, electoral process ha has been over the years. It yeah. takes real and the guts. Of violence yes. hanging over the spectre yes. of violence. Yes, it takes yeah. real guts to, you know, for citizens to go out there. So we must celebrate them. And uh, we must also say and uh, 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 reflect on the fact that the nature of the deployment, you know, from the security agencies we saw this time around mm -hmm. provided some element of deterrence. Right. And it's that element of deterrence that is uh, responsible for the fact that you know we didn't see a massive scale, uh, you know, overrunning of, of of the process. But should we uh, always depend on that approach? That That's deployment of hardware question. 
all over the state, yeah. uh, armored car, you know, armored tanks, you know, all over the place because we want to do an election. It's almost antithetical to the whole concept yeah. of democracy. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's, absolutely. Yeah. it's um, securitization. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And democracy is about, it should be about freedom. Absolutely. The freedom is not just limited to the practice mm. in itself, but the processes that engender democracy. And one of that process is election. So, but what we see increased, you know, securitization, militarization, uh, it creates a different atmosphere. I was not too happy um, 24 hours ago when I saw, um, you know, very senior military officials telling us that election in this state will be free and fair, you know. I was wondering that a soldier, you know, telling us about election being free and fair. It is not their fault, but it is what we have grown our democracy to become. You know, one of force, you know, die-heartedness, you know, winning at all costs and increased tribunalization of the process. And that's what is causing uh, the off-season election that we're talking about. What is yeah. the guarantee in Gozi mm -hmm. that even with the ongoing adjudication at the state level, that we will not have um, one or two more states joining the off circles election? There's there no guarantee go. because there you, process, go. you heard the former president yeah, the there saying not concluded yet. You, you won't know, be surprised if the presidential election yeah, becomes even the presidential an, election, an off some cycle. Cases, some cases are still being adjudicated. Right, we're yeah. not sure yet. Until the whole thing is concluded before we know that, yes, it mm. will remain at seven, you know. Yes, right. you will say this earlier, President, the Jonathan consider it problematic. I don't think so. Uh, it's more about our attitude. It doesn't really matter to me when elections hold, you know, it's just about organization. Understand what, go what governance and statecraft means mm. and focusing on it as a result. Um, not just, not about, um, you know, creating activity and, and thinking that we're in a democracy. We understand at that level. Um, we're in a democracy, no doubt, you know, but we need to enhance the character of the democracy, democracy so that we can be counted point. among the salutary. Absolutely. Very salutarily <laughs> <laughs> uh, said. Thank you so much. I think this is where I have to say thank you to both of you. Uh, Professor uh, Abiodun Adeni is Dean, Faculty, Postgraduate School, Bayes University, and mm -hmm. a RISE Analyst. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Sri Ajanoku. Thank you so much for joining us also. Thank you.